for those who would like to ask questions, um, please try to get to take your questions, but please don't be shy. We have this microphone down here. If you'd like to stand up and learn the microphone, um, that would be really great. Please don't be shy. It seems really cool. Um, yeah, thanks for having this. Um, a comment, I think, first, and then, then a question. Um, it was uh, stated in the, um, the preamble, I guess, word by Barbara, that, uh, that we're lucky to live in a healthy agricultural sector. And um, I'm not sure I would agree with that. Um, you know, a burgeoning farmer's market is not necessarily a successful agricultural community. I think that's probably you know, a couple hundred acres at best in a certain kind of production. I think most of our region is, is uh, deeply invested in the industrial and factory um, farming that seems to be in disfavor here today. You know, it would have been interesting to have someone from the Department of Agriculture here <laughs> because, as we know, our land-grant university, Virginia Tech, is heavily supportive in teaching and promoting a certain kind of agriculture for the most part. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of inroads being made. My question is, um, has anyone here seen an example of an emerging or a functioning regional food system? And uh, you know that, I, I'm not talking about a project like green carts or a farmer's market, because there's a lot of those good examples of projects within communities. But I'm talking about a functioning or at least an emerging food system regionally, including farmers, uh, um, infrastructure, um, markets, soils, community, uh, employment, these kind of things. And if no, or if so, how could our land-grant university help make that happen here? Here, not somewhere else, here. So can I just ask a clarifying question, even though I'm not gonna be able to answer it? Yeah. <laughs> so you mean, by that you mean that there, it's more than a, the, the programs, that, that that's kind of like the majority of what's going on in a particular region as opposed to? Yeah, just basically where, where farmers can grow for the region. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's probably not completely possible, but a good majority of farmers are making a majority. living. It, almost put it this way where it would have a real impact on the local economic development in that region. And all, it's just not all being shipped out to have value added somewhere else. So we almost have to exclude California here. I hate yeah, to say that. Yeah, because California is <laughs> very much so that, right. but I mean, then it wipes yeah, out everybody else, right? We really almost have to exclude California, <laughs> seriously. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, from, from our type of climate in yeah. Minnesota and Iowa. Well, it's, it's a great question, and, uh, you know, to uh, uh, piggyback onto what uh, Karen just talked about in terms of this being an interesting moment that we have. And one of the things that, because uh, I, I travel around the country a lot now, one of the things I'm starting to see bubble up, uh, mostly again in our major urban communities, but it's, but it's also to some extent in, in our rural communities, is the concept of the food shed, uh, which is borrowed obviously from the watershed. So it's not about local anymore in terms of you know, the number of miles, but what's appropriate to a local community and, and people in the community becoming engaged as food citizens, which is, I think, the major contribution that the local movement has provided us because it has gotten people more engaged in their own community. And so we have a movement out in New York now called the Food Commons, which is uh, located primarily in Los Angeles and San Francisco at this point. But uh, a number of very uh, influential people, some of them financial investors who are looking at this as an investment opportunity. And what they're envisioning is uh, these networks of food sheds throughout, eventually, like, you know, over the next hundred years, what we'll see is that the, in their view, what we'll see is the global food system, this unified, homogenized system, will become dysfunctional and disappear. And what you'll see is these community food arrangements that will be of different sizes depending on where they are and the populations and all those other factors. But it's going to be people engaged in their own community deciding, and have, with food sovereignty becoming much and much more popular, people deciding what's appropriate for the food system in their own community. How do we, how do, how do we, how do we uh, establish food security and food sustainability in our own community? And, if you, and this is going to be more on an ecological basis and consequently they're not all going to be alike, but they will all be connected through information and through some trade because, you know, we're going to trade among these communities. Uh, so you can imagine, if you can imagine a global food system consisting of these networks, you know, all over the planet 
Uh, and so in Africa, you know, people deciding what's good for communities in Africa for, for farmers and for food security, et cetera, and people in Iowa doing the same thing. Uh, so I, that's, that to me is a very exciting kind of thing that's, that's becoming a part of the food culture now. It's still in its very early stages, uh, but I'm seeing it in New York, I'm seeing it in Los Angeles, I'm seeing it in Detroit, seeing it to some extent evolving in Chicago just in the last couple of weeks. So, uh, you know, it's going, to be, it's going to be an interesting time. Barbara. Hi, Barbara. How are you? <laughs> Just great. Uh, I, I want to raise another issue about the food system <clears throat> that I've, uh, I've heard uh, mentioned, I think, only once or twice uh, since I've, I've been here. I was a little bit late. I apologize. And that's packaging. Uh, and, <clears throat> and packaging raises the question of the chemical industry uh, and the, um, the grandfathering in of chemicals that have been used in commerce for uh, decades or generations that have not been tested for safety in term, uh, 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 for, uh, for humans. Uh, an issue that I've been particularly interested in and was teaching about in my History of Science course last spring is bisphenol A, BPA, which is a resin that is used in the lining of most cans, including soft drink cans, food cans and beer cans. <laughs> uh, and bisphenol, bisphenol A is an endocrine disruptor. Uh, it means that it disrupts uh, our hormone systems. Uh, and it, I believe, it ha is considered an obesogen uh, by, uh, uh, by some of the people who've been doing that research. Uh, and so uh, the chemical industry doesn't want all of these grandfathered in chemicals, uh, particularly uh, something that has such a widespread usage as bisphenol A in can linings. It's one of the largest chemicals in commerce uh, in the United States at any rate. Uh, so how do we address the questions of packaging and the toxicity of packaging when it's very hard to get support to do, to do that kind of research? Let me just raise one alternative, and, and you've been talking about the activism. Uh, it, it was moms that got bisphenol A out of, of baby bottles and sippy cups, and presumably it's been consumers that have gotten some grocery chains, like Kroger, for example, to pledge to take bisphenol A not only out of all of its own uh, Kroger line products, but also to replace its register tape. Virtually all the register tape you get around has bisphenol A in it, and it is, and, and it is uh, powdery and, and penetrates the skin, uh, and is very dangerous for young cashiers who might be thinking about getting pregnant, uh, because there's, there's a window of vulnerability in pregnancy even before the woman knows she's pregnant, when the bisphenol A is, is extremely dangerous to the developing fetus. So is it, is it community activism or activism uh, toward grocery chains that's going to help here? Uh, what do we do about the chemical industry? I'd appreciate your thoughts. Let, let me jump in on that because I have a whole chapter in here on, on obesogens, environmental toxins and obesogens, and I've been following this, this as well, and I'm completely with you on, on being so angry about it. And it's unfortunately not only bisphenol A, I mean, there, there's studies that are showing quite a few different, um, quite a few different pesticides and chemicals throughout, not only throughout the food system, but in furniture, in, in makeup, and all sorts of places that are endocrine disruptors and are likely obesogens. Um, and what's really scary about them is everybody assumes it's just about changing up metabolism so people digest differently. It's not. These are these these chemicals are change are affecting people in utero and directing biological pathways to make them bigger, irrespective of how many calories they will ever eat. So it's pretty frightening stuff. Um, and so one of my concerns, and one of the reasons I, I, I say we need to look at policy and not only bringing good food, is we're very, very excited about delicious vegetables, delicious fresh fruits and vegetables. I love delicious fresh fruits and vegetables too, but we're, when, we, when there's pieces of our food system that aren't, don't, that don't, don't have to do with nutrients and don't have to do with calories, we're missing the boat on that. 
And so my concern is that so much activism is, is focused on, on calories and nutrition and not focused on the chemicals. Now what to do about that is tough, but this is when I look to Rachel's work on the anti-biotech industry, which is, you've got to read her book, it's, but it's really <laughs> phenomenal about, you know, because one of the things that she argues here is that w what, would, what would biotech look like today without this movement? And so we've put, what's happened with food movements, I mean, food movements have become so directed toward bringing healthy, good food, and have, in my mind, are really <coughs> missing the boat on contesting the chemical industry and contesting agricultural pesticides. Um, and we have some models of, of, of what, you know, including the anti-biotech work that shows what activists can do. So I really want to point back to Rachel's work to say, it's not easy, it's much more difficult in this political climate to, to stop a chemical industry than to like get a philanthropist to say we're gonna feed you know, 100 kids at a school today. Um, I think activism could be incredibly effective yeah. on this kind of issue. Actually, yeah. one of the things I did in this research on the end of my tech movement was I, compared, I looked at why activism in Europe is so effective and not very effective here. And it had in part to do with the fact that and it's a long story, but um, in Europe, the European Union and various European governments were not so opposed to labeling. They basically, early on, allowed labeling of GM foods. And once they had that, the activists could seize upon that, and people had a choice in the market, and they also pressured the supermarkets very, mm -hmm. very heavily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just the way we talk about Kroger's, they pressured the supermarkets to stop carrying the stuff. And once one supermarket decided not to carry it anymore, all the others within 13 months went yep. GM free. I mean, right. they weren't literally GM free because they already, you know, there were there were some genetic you know, modified yeah. products in there. But basically, they agreed to stop buying GM products um, or products made with GM ingredients. So activism can be very effective. I think what has to happen here is. There has to be, more, there's got to be the groundwork around the issue so that and the activists get fired up about it, so that people, I mean, it could be, and all of us can be activists. Somebody, somebody's got to get ticked off enough to say, we're going to start an organization, we're going to start fighting this thing. And once it becomes public, I think this is exactly the kind of issue that various groups would pick up on. Because personally, I didn't hear about this until yesterday. When I was sitting on the plane next to Julie, she started telling me about these endocrine disruptors. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the area, and I haven't heard about it. I mean, that's how little, yeah. uh, I think, circulation it's getting. And so there needs to be both research, but there also needs to be advocacy around it so that people start to worry about it. And once that happens, I think the ball can start rolling very yeah. quickly. And then the producers of these chemicals will be isolated because I do think that the food uh, processors are not going to, there's going to be a separation of interest there. Their interest is in selling the food. They don't care whether the plastic that they're wrapping it in has BPA or not. I don't know what BPA is used in, frankly. But, um, so there's going to be, it's not going to be that hard to divide and conquer that group, really. Um, <coughs> You, you, you might be very interested to know that when the big groups that control food manufacturing and marketing in this country, the Food Marketing Institute and the Grocery Manufacturers Association, when they get together and talk about sustainability and food, the conversation hardly ever gets beyond packaging. So there might be an entry point for you because these organizations are not really talking about sustainable agriculture, they're not really talking about regional food systems. What they're talking about is how can we reduce and make our packaging more efficient because they're, they're practically afraid to look inside the package. So the package is where they're already looking and there's a huge amount of energy in those groups with the companies that belong to those, the Kroger's, the Albertsons, the Walmart's, the Target's, etc. Huge amount of energy around packaging right now. Seize upon it. <laughs> Actually, there's one more thing that you, you mentioned at the very beginning, which is how do we get more research on this? And I think you're absolutely right, because what will happen in terms of the interaction between the activist movements is that they need scientific research to say, look, this is a real effect. There's really something going on here. So that the more that university scientists or other scientists can actually produce empirical studies <coughs> that show us that gives activists something to go to town with, because they're very effective in using the science card. Um. Yeah, I would say the packaging scientists. I mean, go to packaging, go to 
cutting edge packaging companies, European packaging companies, and say, hey, this is a problem, do this research, let's get this change in this country. I mean, they've got money. Yeah, uh, my question has to do, kind of we touched on it a little bit um, with the, uh, the vertical farms um, and how, how in third world countries with population growth blowing up like it is, how, how are we going to deal with that with organic farming, which doesn't produce the high yields that conventional farming does? Um, Fred, maybe you can touch on that too because you do own a uh, organic farm, and I was wondering what kind of yields you get as um, compared to the yields that you would have using conventional farming techniques. I'll, I'll just briefly uh, comment. Uh, the the what I tried to describe earlier and didn't do a good job, obviously, was that what we're finding with studies that are out there, including uh, the one by Jules Pretty that I mentioned, that. Yields for organic agriculture or sustainable agriculture, agroecological practices, whatever you want to call them, are comparable and sometimes, and a lot of times, higher than conventional yields. So what we are, you know, those practices are working. They're, they're, they're producing enough feed, uh, enough food to produce, uh, to, to feed enough people. And, um, you know, I think uh, the problem is that they don't get the recognition that they deserve. They don't uh, get the funding and investment again that they deserve. And Fred, I'm sure, can talk, much more eloquently about this than I can, but I, I think um, you know, uh, making sure that that agricultural development includes sustainable agriculture is, is really key. That not everything has to be dependent on on conventional agriculture practices. Can, can I jump on this one? I mean, we're we're assuming that we don't produce enough food in the world, and one of the problems is we produce in the United States. We produce way too much food. We produce too much food, and that's causing as many problems in, in food as anything, because what happens with that is farmers have lobbied heavily to make sure we can ship those foods abroad, and that, that food is essentially subsidized by the federal government, and it goes abroad, and it puts farmers out of business. So while where there are places where food production is more touch and go, we're, that we, we, all, we just always assume that there's not enough food, and there's often too much food, and so it's like really changing up the, the incentives. So there's, we're producing foods where it needs to be produced for people to reach, but too much food can be as much of a problem as too little food in, in, in creating hunger. Yeah, one of the interesting things is that's absolutely the case in India. I mean, you think of India, I mean, I'm sure many people love the image that India does, has all many, many hungry people. It does. It also has an immense surplus of food. The problem is it has many, many poor people who don't have the resources. Right. They don't have you know, the entitlement to buy the food, as the March of Sun said in 1981. Um, so it is. The population question is a real red herring and very tricky one because it's, you know, what seems logical is actually completely wrong, I think. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the question which is almost always in the public media now is how are we going to feed 9 billion people? And I've said for a long time it's the wrong question. Because first of all, uh, as, as has been mentioned, we're already producing enough food to feed 9 billion people. Uh, the problem is that they, we have uh, a billion people now that don't have access to the food, primarily because they're because of poverty. Uh, you know, Neil Harrell, who is uh, uh, retired now, but an economist at Iowa State University, developed a paper for us at the Leopold Center a few years ago uh, about this problem, and he said the problem of hunger in America comes down to three things: income, income, and income. Yep. And you know, if you don't have the income to purchase food, then you can't purchase food, even though you know. The, or and, and of course, also problem of distribution, but that's also determined by the income. You know, the Institute for Agricultural Trade Policy in Minnesota uh, did a study back in 1997, because you know, out in the heartland, in, you know, in, in the middle of America, we always pride ourselves that we're feeding the world. And so they wanted to find out how much of the corn and soybeans that's produced in the heartland that goes down the Mississippi River for export actually goes to the 25 hungriest countries, as the 25 poorest countries. And what they found was that, I think if I remember the exact statistics here, but it was something like 2.3% of the soybeans and about 3.1% of the corn. Uh, all of the rest of it went to OECD countries, in other words, the wealthy countries. So we weren't feeding the world at all. And it wasn't because we weren't producing enough corn and soybeans, it was because you know, people in the poor countries, in the 25 poorest countries, couldn't afford to buy it. 
Um, so, you know, we have to look at these issues. Uh, you know, we, we always tend to want to try to simplify problems. I mean, and that's part of our culture, you know, <laughs> this, you know, uh, linear cause-effect relationship kind of science that we've developed. So we always figure it's got to be a simple way to solve the problem. But problems are always tend to be more complex. And so we have to, we have to engage ourselves in these issues and understand what the actual problems are. The other thing is about defeating nine billion people is that that's generally then used as a moral justification to continue doing what we're doing. That's We've right. got to rev it up and intensify it a little bit right. more yeah. rather than really looking at what the problems are. Right. And um, so these are, you know, these are cultural issues. They're, they're issues of public policy. Uh, they're issues of all of us. Uh, and one of the things that I think is important about meetings like this is for us to begin to educate ourselves about what some of these issues really are and how we can become engaged as citizens. Yeah. Uh, you know, on the packaging thing, there's a friend of mine that the way they've solved that problem is every time they go into the supermarket to buy a product that they think is packaged unnecessarily, they unpackage it right there in the store and leave it. Oh, I do that. Say, <laughs> you know, I'm not taking this garbage home with me because it's That's not so necessary. Funny. I you know, do that you, too. you deal with it. <laughs> so, you know, there are some, there are some interesting things that we can all do as individuals to make a statement, you know, about what we don't like in the current food system. And then eventually that brings about changes. So. I would love to leave a meat cow behind. <laughs> uh, I really do want to get your question in, please. Thank you all for being here in Blacksburg. Um, I'm sorry to answer a sp specific question, but I wanted to ask Danielle, um, what was the impetus for the two-year tour collecting the stories from farmers in Asian Africa, and what's going to be done with that information? Um, I'll answer your second part of the question first. Uh, we produced a book called State of the World 2011, Innovations That Nourish the Planet. Uh, that's been uh, out in the United States since January. We're releasing it all over the world um, in about 22 different languages now. Um, so it's being distributed uh, uh, to as many places, especially where we did the research, as we can. Um, we also have a website that's called nourishingtheplanet.org where we're highlighting the innovations that we saw on the ground, um, and I hope you'll visit. That's also in multiple, language, multiple languages so that we can get it to as wide an audience as possible. And uh, the story of how the grant came about and, and our research is a much uh, longer one, and, and I'll probably give too many details, but we were funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is one of the biggest funders of, of agriculture now in the world. And they initially came to the World Watch Institute really asking for our advice on um, sort of the, their bad reputation in the agriculture world for um, some of the really technology-focused um, investments that they've made, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, we worked with them to, to convene a meeting of sustainable agriculture and environmental advocates and activists in, in Washington, and then really just further discussions with them. They really wanted us to highlight innovations that they might not know about, innovations that their, their program officers weren't seeing on the ground. And so that was really um, what led me to you know, pack up and, and spend uh, the, that 18 months really, really listening to folks and, and learning things so that I could um, be you know, a very small uh, facilitator to make sure that those, those exciting innovations, these really groundbreaking innovations that no one knows about, get the attention and ultimately the uh, research and, and investment that they need. Well, thanks to everyone who has come out today and listened to this panel, and please join me in thanking these five incredible people.